Greetings. My name is Kabiri Robinson. And I'm Arzu Osanlu. Thank you for joining us. Yes, and we are coming to you from the University of Washington Simpson Center for the Humanities. We welcome you to the Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations, and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside the global north. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. So we seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study of humanitarianism and emphasize instead experiences in regions across the global south, especially South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Throughout this year, we have been comparing the conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices and illuminate how values beyond those of the Western enlightenment constitute suffering, practices of care and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. So today's event is the first in three webinars in our final theme, Rethinking the Human. Here, we continue the work of decentering the West from ownership of humanitarianism by exploring how our rethinking of humanitarianism's diverse genealogies requires us to encompass different modalities of life and embrace its varied rationalities with diverse forms of care. Through this inquiry, we seek to consider not only the suffering of and care for distant others, but also for the environment, non-human species, and even the dead who are often assumed to be beyond the limits of care. And this brings us to today's event. We are delighted to welcome Professor Sinan Antun, who opens this conversation by exploring how the inequalities that characterize and persist in human life endure in death and grief as well. Erasing some lives also effaces their work and their legacies and thus deprives the living of the otherwise organic relationship to death denying us all an important feature of what it means to be human. Antoon asks us to think of war's collateral damage as a black hole into which worlds disappear and from which not even the dead are safe. Our colleague Christian Capotescu, the postdoctoral scholar for the Sawyer Seminar, will be today's moderator. And now I turn to him to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Arzu. And I would like to welcome our speaker today, Professor Sinan Antun, who will speak on rescuing the dead. Sinan Antun is Associate Professor at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. His teaching and research interests lie in pre-modern and modern Arabic literature and contemporary Arab culture and politics. Sinan is the author of several books, most recently of The Poetics of the Obscene, his essays and creative writings have appeared in major journals and publications in the Arab world. And we're also joined today by our esteemed colleague, Salim Kourou, taking the role of discussant for this webinar. Salim is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization at the University of Washington. Welcome. And now I would like to welcome Sinan and Salim and let them say a few words before we begin with our program. Thank you so much, Christian. I'm so delighted and honored to be here. So thank you, Arzu. Thank you, Kabiri. And thank you, Salim. It's wonderful to be in this conversation with you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to the questions and answers. I, I also would like to thank all the uh, organizers of the series and this session. And it's an honor for me to uh, be in conversation with Sinan. Material and discursive resources and energies are dedicated to rescue the living from harm and to tend to their wounds. This, however, is often insufficient and care is never carried out equally. Humans 
after all, inhabit radically different positions in the hierarchies that overdetermine in various degrees their lived reality. Hierarchies based on structural, material, and discursive categories inflected by race, gender, class, and national or ethnic belonging. Humans live very unequal lives, and the inequalities that structure their lives extend to their deaths and beyond as well, to shape the ways in which their death is perceived, processed, and thus how their lives are grieved and mourned, if at all, or how their death is dismissed, ignored, unrecorded, or unnoticed. Death is not the total equalizer. It is rather the inequalizer. It reinforces the frames through which we view or keep out of view certain lives and their ends. These frames, as Judith Butler reminds us in her book, Frames of War, When is Life Grievable? Structure a mode of recognition. There is no life and no death without a relation to some frame. Specific lives cannot be apprehended as injured or lost if they are never lived nor lost in the full sense, end of quote. The 18th anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq was just a few weeks ago. I wrote some of these words that I am reading now around the 19th of March, the day when the invasion and military occupation of Iraq began. The day passed in this country without much notice. In April of 2003, a few weeks after the invasion started, the New York Times wrote the following. American officials say numbering the enemy dead in the midst of battle is dangerous and ultimately fruitless. They say it is not a statistic that interests them. They speak in lifeless terms of degrading or attriting enemy military formations so they can assess the strength of the force opposing them. They count destroyed tanks and artillery pieces and missile launchers. They count captured weapons. They do not count people, civilian or military. You know, we don't do body counts, General Tommy Franks said. Civilians, in this case, Iraqi civilians killed in the war are uncounted and thus their lives discounted. The lot of such civilian casualties is not that different beyond the walls of the Pentagon. And the parameters of the military's language and its worldview. A decade before Tommy Franks declared that, quote, we don't do body counts, Madeleine Albright, United States Ambassador to the United Nations and the Clinton administration and many others were confronted with estimated figures of the number of Iraqi children dying as a consequence of US and UN imposed sanctions, which were in the hundreds of thousands. Albright's answer was that, quote, it was a price worth paying. The lives and deaths of these civilians were translated into transactional terms, disposable bargaining chips in a geopolitical game. But there are those who believe that the dead must be counted and strive to do so by any means necessary. In 2003, two academics in the United Kingdom, John Sloboda and Hamid Daradagan, co-founded the Iraq Body Count to record, quote, the violent deaths that have resulted from the 2003 military intervention in Iraq. Its detailed public database maintained by volunteers includes all civilian deaths caused by US-led coalition and Iraqi government forces and paramilitary or criminal attacks by others. Working against the deliberate discursive erasure of civilian deaths, the Iraq body count rescues the dead from oblivion, anonymity, and collective amnesia, providing figures <clears throat> and when possible names. In Iraq itself, the invasion and military occupation dismantled institutional structures and established a sectarian-based political system 
which unleashed chaos, inflicting immeasurable violence against a society already devastated by dictatorship. A society whose social fabric had already been severely damaged by years of the aforementioned genocidal sanctions imposed from 1990 until 2003. The numbers and the corpses were piling up after 2003 as a result of the countless suicide bombings and the militia war. While most of the dead were identified and claimed by loved ones and received a dignified and proper burial, many did not. Some were too disfigured by bombings to be identifiable. Others were left because the morgue was on the other side of the sectarian divide and their relatives could risk their own lives if they were to attempt to go there. That horrendous violence marked an abyss for so many in Iraq as they were reduced to potentially disposable bodies in a landscape and geography of death. Back then, I came across a story about a Muslim Shia cleric <clears throat> from Al Sadr city in Baghdad, whose small charity and group of volunteers took it upon themselves to give the dead a proper burial, irrespective of their confessional affiliations. Sheikh Jamal al Sudani explained his sentiments in an interview with CNN, saying, quote, When I enter the morgue, I don't see these human beings as Christian, Shia, or Sunni, because I see them in death embracing each other. I only think about one thing, that one day I will face the same fate as these people have faced. And will there be someone to take care of me and bury me too? End of quote. The bodies were identified, photographed, and the data stored. They were given a traditional Shia burial, and shrouded and buried in the Najaf, the holy city in southern Iraq. Even the terrorists were buried there. This gesture of rescuing the dead, irrespective of their confessional affiliation, from oblivion and indignity and according their bodies and memories, a modicum of respect transcended the frames and categories that delimit the meaning of humanness or hierarchize human worth. A similar initiative by another Shia cleric in Iraq was begun this past year in the context of another ongoing war, as it has often been described, against the pandemic. The spread of COVID-19 and individual and institutional responses to its lethal effects have highlighted quite painfully the structures of inequality and injustice and the frames and categories that hierarchize human life and human worth. In Iraq, authorities and institutions, like much of the world, were grossly unprepared. The stigma attached to the pandemic's victims and the fear and misinformation were to affect the dead yet again. Christian and Muslim cemeteries refused to receive those who had died because of COVID. The families of those already buried there objected. Moved by the plight of the dead who could not find a home, Sheikh Tahar al Khaqani, a Shiri cleric, secured the blessings of religious authorities and religious endowments in Najaf to designate a quote 1500 acre patch of ground 20 miles from the city of Najaf allocated for the burials, end of quote. The Imam Ali combat division, which was initially formed years back to fight ISIS, volunteered now to run the cemetery. Its medical teams took on the job of receiving the dead, disinfecting the body bags in which they arrived and then washing the deceased. The Corona Cemetery, as it came to be known, has welcomed Sunni Muslims and Christians who were denied burial by their cemeteries. I have explored questions about the relationship between the living and the dead in my research on contemporary Arabic poetry, as well as in my creative work. When I was grappling with how to begin to write a novel about Iraq and what had befallen its people in the aftermath of wars and invasions, I came across a moving story in 2004. It featured a corpse washer in Baghdad 
whose income had quadrupled after the invasion and war, but who was too traumatized by the daily encounter with death and corpses and had intended to leave the country to spare his son his fate. It struck me that the wash house where corpses are purified and shrouded in preparation for burial was one of the few sites and spaces where one could not look away and had to confront the brutality of war and the violence inflicted on human bodies. My research led me to the history of intricate narratives about the rituals of body washing and shrouding in the Islamic tradition. The protagonist of The Corpse Washer, my second novel, Jawad, is born into a traditional Shia family of corpse washers in Baghdad. He is expected to continue the family tradition. Initially, he is fascinated by his father's mysterious profession and he's full of curiosity. Why do we wash the dead, he asks. His father's answer combines both practical and spiritual reasons. He informs him that every dead person will meet with the angels and God Almighty, and therefore must be pure and clean. Decomposition must not show on the body and its odor should be made pleasant. It should be covered so that the hearts of the living be not hardened. When he asks his father about the differences between Shia and Sunni rituals, he is told that they are very minor. Certain details involving the mention of imams and the writing of supplications on the shroud, but nothing major. Other members of monotheistic communities, such as Christians and Jews, may also wash a Muslim if there are no Muslims at hand. The important thing, his father reminds him, is to be possessed of noble intentions. But the young boy's artistic tendencies and rebelliousness and later his lack and loss of faith to compel him to resist and choose a radically different path. His father's profession is too morbid and disquieting for him. He chooses to study art instead in the hopes of becoming a sculptor. Rather than tending to the dead, he wants to create and celebrate life. However, economic hardship brought about by the debilitating sanctions and two wars and his father's death eventually forced him to return to the very same profession and atmosphere he had tried to escape. While not sharing his father's faith, years later he comes to understand and appreciate his father's dedication to this profession and realizes the importance of the rituals he performed which he now understands are an art of sorts, but with different rewards. He also learns that life and death were not, as he had always thought, two separate worlds with clearly marked boundaries, but are conjoined, sculpting each other. If the protagonist of the corpse washer is haunted by the daily encounters with death and with disfigured bodies whose names and features he writes down in his notebook, one of the two narrators in my last novel, The Book of Collateral Damage, is not only haunted by the destroyed bodies and lives of humans only, but those of non-humans too. Life for him is not restricted to the human body, but extends beyond it to embrace all beings and objects, flora, fauna, and even inanimate objects. He heeds the call of an old line of poetry attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib, often quoted by the mystics, which says, you may think you are but a tiny speck, but the wide world is encapsulated within you. I began my remarks with a reference to the frames that keep lives out of our view or any view. The concept of collateral damage is one of those grand frames, a discursive black hole into which entire worlds and lives are disappeared and consigned to oblivion. The narrator is haunted by the ghosts and voices disappearing into the black hole of collateral damage and is at pains to document their life and mark their death. The ghosts of several writers hover over the novel and its themes. Like Walter Benjamin, the narrator believes that, quote, even the dead 
will not be safe from the enemy if he is victorious, end of quote. He also internalizes a variation of one of Benjamin's notions that, quote, life is not limited to organic corporeality. The concept of life is given its due only if everything that has a history of its own and is not merely the setting for history is credited with life, end of quote. Everything has a history. In one of his late poems entitled The House as Casualty, the late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish wrote about the life of a house. He was probably referring, sorry, to a Palestinian house demolished by the Israeli army. I'll read quotes from this poem. In one minute, the entire life of a house is ended. The house as a casualty is also mass murder, even if it's empty of its inhabitants. A mass grave of raw materials intended to build a structure with meaning. In every object, there is a being in pain and houses are killed just like their inhabitants. And the memory of objects is killed. All these things are a memory of the people who no longer have them and of the objects that no longer have the people. Our things die like us, but they aren't buried with us. <clears throat> but writing the history of the vanquished and all the objects and being destroyed by war, minute by minute, as the narrator had wanted, is quite daunting. It poses methodological and logistical challenges. Writing the history of destruction of the first minute takes many pages. His manuscript remains unfinished and is unfinishable. One of the most memorable lines written by Abu Ala al Ma'ari, the Arab poet and philosopher who died in Syria in 1057, says, quote, tread gently, for the soil of this earth is made of these bodies. These lines are as meaningful and maybe more meaningful today. The world we inhabit, as well as its wealth, are premised on and are by and large the product of the pain, sweat, and blood of others, past and present. We should think of the bodies in Al-Ma'ari's verse in actual and not metaphorical terms. Bodies colonized, enslaved, exploited, incarcerated, damaged, and destroyed. They may also be read as the bodies of other species and sentient beings decimated for profit and to maintain lethal frames, exploitative structures and hierarchies that perpetuate injustice and harm. Tending to the memory and ghosts of those dead bodies is necessary and a prerequisite for re-examining and transforming our collective attitude towards living bodies in the present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinan. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for reminding us at the beginning of this marvelous talk of the 18th anniversary of an unjust war, Iraq war, that created disastrous consequences. To start this conversation, I would like you to extend on your comment. I quote you, life and death sculpting each other. There are now over 550,000 victims of the epidemic only in the US. They are, I assume, uh, recorded, registered, and duly buried hopefully. The Iraq body count site you mentioned uh, numbered the identified civilian deaths from violence over 200,000. We don't even have a approximate number of those who have been devoured by oceans, mountains, borders, escaping harsh conditions of living in order to reach safer, better conditions. The cemetery is established by Sheikh Jamal al-Sudani and Sheikh Tahir al-Haqani, uh, and the Iraq body count are examples of care for the dead who would have otherwise fallen out of the frames through which we view life. Uh, numbers, on the other hand, may also shroud the dead, rolling bodies into digits, dulling our sense of mourning, impeding our recognition of the life 
uh, the dead may represent. Those numbers may normalize even violent, uh, unmourned, ignored death. What may be other forms of caring for the dead beyond creating cemeteries for them and counting, which are already meaningful uh, at, attempts? Also, in your novels, people have uh, relationships with the non-human. They are central. For example, trees are important in each novel. Uh, date palms in the Baghdad Eucharist, the pomegranate tree and the corpse washer, which you mentioned in your talk, uh, it is central in connecting living and the dead. In the collateral damage, musical and instruments, books, horses, other non-humans narrate their death. Would you please, I am repeating my question, expand on the phrase life and death sculpting each other so that we may have a discussion about possible ways, other possible ways of caring for the dead or uh, some details about what you have already mentioned the dead sentient or insentient to consider new possibilities in order to transcend, I quote you, lethal frames, exploitative structures and hierarchies that perpetuate injustice. Yes, thank you so much. I mean, your, your question is, is very important and I, I, I'm not sure I have an answer. I mean, I, I started that statement from the from Jawad in the novel because uh, he begins with his own in a way narcissistic secularism which completely dismisses religious traditions and with this thought somehow that life you know he can celebrate life and he can avoid death but then comes to realize that the two are intertwined. And to me, after writing this and going back and thinking about it, also in the context of everything that was happening, come to think that in a way we cannot, it's, uh, we cannot understand one without understanding the other. And as I tried to um, make the point in the short presentation based on you know, so many other scholars and writers and that how we view death depends on how we view life and whose life matters more. And as, as Judith Butler says, which lives are grievable and which ones are not? I think that's, the, and I agree with you completely. I, I all, all, always think of it in a way that statistics and numbers, of course, are not the answer. The uh, uh, Wadud in the novel himself says that, that, and there is the notorious quote by Stalin, which I always remember, is that, you know, one, one death is a tragedy, but one million is a statistic. Uh, so the work that Iraq body counts does is, of course, very crucial and very important, but there are other frames and gestures that most of us are guilty of, whereby we dismiss um, and gloss over um, you know, the suffering and the pain and the death of others. I don't have the answer. I think, you know, what I tried in the novel is that how does one not look away, basically? How does one confront the reality in its totality, which of course takes a lot of emotional energy. And um, that's what I, what I think art in a way, for me at least, and where poetry and creativity and art, because it, it mediates everything and represents the world we live in, becomes um, a site where we are forced to not look away. Not always, of course, but it's, it's a very important site for me to explore these issues. Now, I just wanted to say that the reason why also I wanted to highlight these cemeteries is that predominantly when our part of the world is spoken of. Um, I don't want to call it the Middle East, whatever, the Near East. Uh, it's all, all of these terminology is so problematic, but we can't escape it. But it is always, or by and large, represented as this site of uh, violence, unexplained violence that has no history. And there is so much focus on sectarianism. There is, of course, sectarianism, there is violence, but also there is a long tradition and history as your wonderful series is trying to show of care and 
amazing, courageous gestures in the midst of massive violence. So to me, I mean, I, I, I was fascinated by this Sheikh because not only was he burying non-Shias, he was actually burying terrorists, which is something quite important for us to ponder and think of, is that he is able to transcend so many structures and, and the entire edifice of his ideological background to you know, reach out and accord this other human being who might have tried to kill him and his family. And again, recently uh, with this other example, I, I think it was just very moving for me, even though I'm not a person of faith, but that these people who were rejected by their own communities found refuge on the other side, quote unquote. Thank you. I would like to thank you for this, for these details um, and um, to focus on what you just mentioned in your reply about art. Uh, your novels are uh, fascinating um, examples of both formal innovation uh, and content wise, uh, they are really communicative of the ordeal of many Iraqis of different faiths because your na narrators are very different individuals all from Baghdad <laughs> but I mean different parts of Baghdad so reading the four novels available in English uh, gives a strong sense mm -hmm. and I think one of the strength is you're one of those uh, novelists like Roberto Bologna for example who is really uh, referencing poetry a lot like poets, ancients and modern speaks in their voices sometimes in the in the form of fragments that come up uh, during the narration, uh, kind of interrupting or suspending the narration, but adding another dimension to the events that are narrated by the narrator. <laughs> Sorry for narr narrator, narrated, etc. So I would like to ask you about this. Um, uh, thinking about the current theme of the humanitarianism series, remaking the human, I wonder how you connect poetry to care and hospitality. Can a frame that draws on poetry transform our approach or arts, let's say, uh, our approach to these concepts of care, hospitality? I may uh, detail this question a bit further. Uh, with your, like, I mean, with the importance, the function of poetry in your work on Iraq, both novels, commentaries, your commentaries also have a lot of references uh, uh, to poetry. Uh, Iraq is in the US or Iraq. Do you think poetry is experienced similarly in the global North, let's say US today, uh, as it is in Iraq or in the global South in general? So. These are not fair questions, but I want to hear your thoughts on these. No, that's <laughs> a very big question. <laughs> that comes up a lot in that, you know, is there a difference in the, you know, the uh, relevance and popularity and the in intense emotions associated with poetry in the global South as compared to the global North? Um, you know, I, I always say in a way, poetry in Iraq is like uh, soccer in Brazil. You know, everyone is, grows up thinking that they are a poet until they change their mind. But I, I, having said that, it might seem that in the global North and in this country where we are working and living that poetry is not as important as it is, but I think it still is. I always bring the example or remind people that in moments of tragedy and intense pain, people still resort to poetry right after 9-11 actually, which was a, a monumental event. Uh, a lot of Americans turned to poetry as they have been during COVID because poetry has that capacity in a way to crystallize and configure not knowledge, but also very complicated feelings. I mean, I forgot who is the poet who, who describes poetry as existential prayer. And it is a sort of intellectual and emotional prayer uh, that manages to 
uh, speak to certain complexities that are otherwise difficult to reach in a different form. I'm not canceling out the other forms, but it seems that humans have a need for poetry and for the poetic in their daily life. Um, you know, I mean, in, in, the, in the ancient times, it's also linked to some kind of communion with the metaphysical, with, with the beyond. Uh, it was even sacred in a way. Uh, it was always associated with sacred rituals. So for also, I'm uh, as you said in a way, my novels all take place mostly in Iraq, where you know poetry is is very important in, and it's still uh, practiced and used uh, on a daily basis in all kinds of formats. I mean, just a few weeks ago, the Pope uh, visited Iraq, and it was a major event, and a lot of people compose poems, serious poems, but also, you know, parodies. They use the Pope's visit for political parody and critique and so on and so forth. But, and, and although there are always premature uh, obituaries about the end of poetry, uh, but the amazing thing, I think this applies globally is that with this new technology, actually, we have even more dis dissemination of poetry than we had ever, ever had before. And maybe it's because I started out as a poet, so I'm trying to smuggle poems through my novels also. <laughs> and you also publish poetry and translate yes. beautiful translations from Arabic poetry. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this is, uh, if we go back to the uh, Rescuing the Dead, the title of the uh, talk, there is also, for example, I think it was T.S. Eliot who talked about uh, some sort of provincialism, which is not of space, but of time. Uh, he considered uh, like this kind of provincialism considers the past according to him as dead and useless and values the present at the cost of the past. Most probably he was talking about modernism at that time, kind of an in insider critique maybe. Uh, and uh, he further says uh, the corrective to such a provincialism is literature. And Dan goes on to say Europe is a single whole, etc. While talking about universalism, he goes back to Europe, etc. But this brings to my mind past can be, or the dead may be sometimes an oppressive reality. Uh, if I am putting the words right, this is kind of a dangerous field. In a sense, may represent tradition, uh, which may be framed to perpetuate certain injustices. For example, in Ijam, there is your first novel, an Iraqi rhapsody, you mentioned there's a scene, a Zane, the narrator uh, visits uh, enclosed space, a, mart uh, a cemetery for British martyrs. Mm. And there comes up a discussion with his girlfriend. I forgot that character's name, that me. Ali. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, and he, uh, this, uh, like, I would like you to tell me about, because in each novel also, I can question you uh, about the novels as well. I think under the light of your talk, uh, there is this dad, like El Jawahidi's poem for his brother. I couldn't find a translation, but you describe it in <laughs> two novels, at least you mentioned <laughs> that poem, this elegy, etc. But this hierarchy, as you mentioned, martyrs, because that is Zayn's question, uh, do martyrs really have a special place in afterlife or something? Can you a bit expand on this hierarchy is... I try to get the most out of you since I have you. <laughs> I mean about, you mean about the past or about the hierarchies of death or? No, I think they are kind of uh, related because uh, our perception of past uh, either as an oppressive background yeah. that we need to break free uh, may be applied to the dead, uh, which may represent like in Te Elliot's case, a past. Uh, for him, it is important, but for a European tradition to be like, it is a very 
elevated past he is talking about Virgil and other masters, etc. No, I mean, definitely. I, you know, there, there was an evolution in the way I thought of the past. Uh, you know, this novel that you mentioned, Erjam, I started writing it when I was living in Iraq under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, where the Ba'ath Party was very uh, efficient in deploying a certain type of past for its own purposes, of course. And with the war with Iran and so many people dying, there was an institutionalization of this, the martyr figure for political purposes, of course, that imbued uh, the martyr with, you know, highly politicized meaning and so on and so forth. So in that novel, there is a rejection of that type of past that the state and the party was trying to impose on everyone. But frankly, as things developed with me personally in thinking, I came to realize also, uh, perhaps sadly because of so many people who died in the region in Iraq, that uh, the past is itself actually a site of struggle for the present and for the future. And I always like to quote Faulkner who says, the past is not dead yet, the past is not even past. So this brings us to the very important topic of haunting, of how we are haunted by the ghosts of the dead, particularly those who died unjustly or whose death was not marked. And you know, we have that extensively in literature from Hamlet, but, but others as well. And one poet who's whose poetry I translated from Arabic to English, and I've, you know, I'm working on a book about him who's an Iraqi American poet, Sargon Bolas, who grew up in Iraq, but left and came to the US. Uh, in his late poetry as an Iraqi living in the United States, you know, the, the, he writes extensively and there are so many ghosts in his poetry. And I see that, of course, uh, constructed in a very particular way, but this is where the past becomes very important, I think, politically, uh, because if you do not subscribe to a linear uh, notion of history, and this is where I always have to bring in Walter Benjamin and his notion of history and how do we break out of this master narrative of history to clinch those moments uh, where you kind of disrupt this machinery of the history of the victors to bring back the voices of those who were defeated and silenced and so on and so forth. It's not, it's not easy, but that's also where, where, where poetry comes in. Um, but I know that it's a two-edged sword because the past is often used, of course, to strangle uh, and foreclose the future. But I think even in this country, especially with the recent events, we realize how the past will continue to haunt the present unless society and individuals confront the ghosts of the past. Thank you. These are all very insightful answers. I think uh, we are running out of our conversation time and oh. Uh, Christian appears immediately. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sinan. I'm looking forward to... Thank you for wonderful questions. And thanks to both for these really interesting comments and points that you've touched on. Um, and let me start with the first question here to sort of circle back slightly to the question of humanitarianism. And Sinan, you offer a really refreshing account of care that opens up a conversation about alternative approaches to life and death. In what ways do you think your emphasis on caring for the dead disrupts conventional humanitarian frameworks that focus by design on saving lives and preserving life? Um... You know, I think I answered that question in my novel better than whatever answer I'm going to give you right now. But once again, I think somehow, I mean, it relates to this unanswerable question about mortality, which has haunted human beings from the earliest times until today. And we, or let's say humans, have 
narratives and frames through which to make sense of death, but also assign death into somewhere and move over, move on and move away and finish with that. I think what, what at least in that novel and the corpse washer through the character of Jawad, who is in one of those few professions where uh, the encounter with death is prolonged. Not only is it prolonged, but he also gets to see what death does to the human body or what other humans, let's say, do to the body. And that forces him and then forces us as readers to not look away and to think of the fate of the body and what it has to go through. So in a way, you know, it kind of slows down what is oftentimes now just a quick resolution to life moving on to death and then moving on to other ones. That's what I can come up with on the spot. Thank you. We have a question that goes slightly more into a literary uh, arena. Could you talk about the disjunction in disposition between the first person narrative, narrator in collateral damage and the wild subjectivity of the tree, the stamp album, the woven rung, objects that narrate their subjectivity in terms of an eye, objects that are in pain. The narrative as a whole moves to merge the two. This observational disposition of the eye appears in your other books as well. The corpse washer, for instance. So the question is, what compels you about this observational clinical eye? Well, I mean, the, the reason why I put the quote from Mahmoud Darwish about the house is that I was, I was in writing or before writing these novels, especially the book of collateral damage, I was, I was thinking of what constitutes life uh, and how life is the configuration of everything around us and that are not limited only to our, to our bodies. But of course, it's so difficult to transcend all of that. And I know I'm straying from the question, but how, how can we listen to objects and trees and to listen to their agony and try to hear them? It might sound insane. Uh, of course, it has to be through human language. There is no other way around. But to go back to Salim's question about poetry, I think it's interesting how Wordsworth says that poetry is the, crystal, the crystallization of human knowledge. And that might sound extreme, but for hundreds of years, poets have written about trees as if trees speak, right? And recently, the scientists have told us that actually trees do speak to other trees. I think it was the German scientists so that's where poetry or poets sometimes anticipate in a way scientific knowledge somehow. Um, to go back to the question, I, I am not a Sufi myself, but I have benefited a lot from, from uh, Sufi poetry whereby there's constantly an attempt to transcend language and to, to reach that point of transcendence that combines or has the human being be in harmony with their surroundings and with everything that is around them. Um, but for the particular narrator Wadud, because he's also uh, traumatized and damaged, there are, there are moments in the novel that not many readers or critics have noticed where the language completely breaks down, of course, because I wanted to indicate that that uh, gesture or attempt is is in itself almost impossible, but he is bound to try to achieve that in, in the narrative. Our, our Q&A is very lively, so I will try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, how do the religious community crossings you describe in the examples of the sheikhs who established cemeteries for the outsider map onto your idea of the body as special or not special. And just to clarify a little more, meaning what is the community that the dead form for people when these crossings occur? 
I, I don't know how to answer this question because um, initially when I when when I was writing the corpse washer, I was thinking how you know unfortunately of course that um, the body almost cannot escape the communal belonging irrespective of uh, the person's own beliefs and whatnot. We've seen many examples of that 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 even beyond life and after that the community lays claim to the body as belonging to itself in a way but the reason why i was fascinated by these two examples because here we have the opposite at least in the last example with covid because of covid the community shuns uh this body that belongs to it officially but the other side has the compassion and I don't want to use the word, but the humanity to welcome that other body. Um, but I mean, the, I, I must confess that this news item was kind of, um, it disrupted my own thinking about that because it kind of, it, it presented an example of someone really uh, piercing all of these accepted uh, frameworks and going beyond them. And, and the next question, in, in fact, ties into news and technology. Uh, so one audience member is curious to learn how you see technologies, e.g. social media, WhatsApp, play into the process of caring for the dead. Um, so this has come into clear view, for instance, in the context of COVID-19, but, but also um, it, as it really requires uh, people to, to mourn at distance through eulogies circulated on Facebook. Um, that also, of course, are in the context of forced displacements of many Iraqis from the country in the wake of the US uh, invasion. So how do you see the possibilities and limits of caring for the dead through technology? And what sort of potential do these modern technologies such as social media have given um, to create inequities of access um, to these forms of mourning in the global south? I mean, that's a great question <laughs> and a great invitation to, to do a lot of research on this. I, I don't know if I have anything uh, very profound to say about this, but I'm always fascinated and haunted also by how social media on the one hand and technology has the potential, of course, to give access to those who usually do not have access, but there are always limits to that because Maybe it's also because I'm a pessimist that all of these new technologies end up at the end of the day uh, reinforcing all of the inequities that were mentioned. I mean, I am old enough to remember when we were told that somehow the internet is going to democratize everything and so on and so forth. But we have seen, but I should say though, uh, what, you know, whether for Iraqis, for Syrians, for others, of course, you know, it has, technology has changed the meaning of, of being distant from one's homeland and one's loved ones. And it has, on the one hand, bridged the gap of distance, but it's also quite alienating in a way. You mentioned the example of mourning from a distance or watching a loved one die. So at, on the one hand, it's a paradox because on the one hand, at least you get to see a loved one and you get to communicate and you get to uh, whether you are, you know, you celebrate or you mourn, but on the other hand, there is also still a gap because it's virtual and it not, it's not actual. But I think, you know, we have yet to learn about all of these changes and all of these modalities, especially with, with COVID. So I'm not, one's, I'm not one to rush into making statements about that. I mean, the first two months I received the an invitation from an Arab writer to write a whole book about how COVID is going to affect writing. I was like, well, we're only beginning, you know, just give me some time to understand what's happening. <laughs> That's a very prudent view, yes. Um, let me get a question to you on concepts, specifically uh, your idea of body counts and start with a bit of a hist historical sort of background here. During the Vietnam War, the US, US military's practice of body counts served to gauge the efficacy of combat efforts in the war against the enemy, but it also fueled countless acts of genocidal violence against local populations. 
So historical precedent really shows that counting bodies may not, may not always serve the purpose of reasserting human dignity. And in some contexts, it might in fact further perpetuate inhumanity. So in your mind, what about the idea of body counts has changed between the 1970s and the Iraq war that gives it today a different moral valence, uh, which might also potentially inform humanitarian discourse? I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about the 91 Gulf War, which is uh, often um, ignored to understand the history of the US with Iraq, but in how the United States or the Pentagon used the 91 war and that other war to kind of deal with its mistakes in Vietnam and to make killing and war more efficient as we know. But I, I mean, I agree in that I highlight the, highlight the Iraq body count, but as Salim's question and comment was making sure that doesn't really solve the problem. But I think that um, having the numbers and having the knowledge of the extent of the damage visited on others by the military uh, is important for activists and for those who are trying to limit the scope of the war and to stop wars. But I'm also very pessimistic, <laughs> despite what I said in my talk and despite uh, highlighting Iraq body count, um, it didn't really matter that much at the end of the day. And it doesn't matter as we speak now because I'm sure most of you know what the drones are doing and how many people are being killed uh, in so many places where the drone warfare is ongoing. In Yemen, we have all the numbers and we have all the statistics and um, that is not really also changing much in terms of the discourse here and there maybe, but it's not having a massive effect. Um, and I, I mean, that, that has to do with so many other things, but I think our society and our world is so saturated with militarism and violence, especially this country. Um, but again, I mean, I, I mentioned Iraq body count because it's important in that context, but I'm, I don't, um, you know, I completely understand the critique, uh, which is very legitimate, that at the end of the day, it does not, um, and as you said, it could actually be used for the opposite purposes. But I'm sure that actually, that the US Army and the Pentagon, they do actually keep tabs uh, on how many people they killed because they are very interested in the efficiency of, of the killing machine and improving it, definitely. We have another conceptual question and this one would turn to rituals. The corpse washer depicts religious ritual for preparing the bodies of the dead. What are your thoughts on other national rituals for the dead like national memorials? For instance, and we can put this in the, in the context of the upcoming 20th anniversary of 9-11, of uh, what kinds of memorials um, are there, perhaps in Iraq, that you could talk about that have, might have a similar function? I mean, of course, memorials, <laughs> most of the time are, memorials are authorized by the state, right? And oftentimes they uh, embody and perpetuate uh, official history and the national myth. So that's why now with the recent events in this country and elsewhere and with the you know, heightened sensitivity about colonial history, we're having all of these efforts by activists to, to bring down statues that perpetuate the actual violence and the discourse of violence. So one should always be very critical of monuments. Of course, monuments that represent the collective will and consensus of community that is uh, represented uh, and has a voice. These are, there are examples and that's perfect. But oftentimes, as we see memorials and monuments are trying to freeze a certain notion of official history. Now in Iraq, there was something that I was going to actually use for the, for the talk, but then I didn't because the talk was limited. But during the Iraq-Iran war, the Saddam Hussein regime uh, commissioned a lot of public uh, monuments. 
And, you know, some of them were, you know, flagrantly celebrating the, 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 the regime and its ideology. But one of them is called the Monument of the Martyrs, Nusbu Shaheed. It's quite aesthetically striking and, and, and um, it's, it represents a blue dome, like the blue dome of the mosque that is severed in half. And it represents the moment when the martyr's soul uh, goes to heaven. And it was, it was uh, designed by a famous Iraqi artist. And it's quite aesthetically pleasing. And now it has a, a basement, not a basement, a floor under and a wall where all the names of the Iraqi soldiers who died in the war with Iran are written. Now, despite how many Iraqis felt about that war, that it was an unjust war and it was problematic, but for so many of the families whose sons died in that war, that place is sacred. And it has the names of their loved ones written down there. Now in 2003, in July of 2003, I went with a collective of colleagues and friends to make a documentary about Iraq. It's called About Baghdad. Uh, we, you know, if you remember the run up to the war, some of you are too young to remember. Uh, this country went to war with Iraq and we never really heard from Iraqis, what Iraqis themselves feel, of course. We heard from some Iraqi Americans who were neocons and wanted to, do, to go to war. So in our documentary, we went to Baghdad and went around Baghdad and spoke to Iraqis from all different backgrounds and different classes. Those who were for the war and those who were against the war. But we also visited some uh, important monuments. We visited this monument of the martyrs and it was occupied by the US Army and it, it was all of the Humvees were parked there and we went downstairs and on the wall that has the names of all of these dead people, there were, you know, papers posted that talk about workouts and about exit and all of that in a, like a, a colossal sign of disrespect uh, for this place. And I, I was really angry uh, for obvious reason, but I was also shocked but this is the level of insensitivity to the memory and the lives of, of those people. So that's one of the few monuments in Iraq that in a way there is a consensus amongst all Iraqis that it speaks to something because it is its design. I highly recommend that you, you, know, you Google image and look at it because it's really beautiful and it's simple and it doesn't have Saddam Hussein's name, not in it and whatnot. Other monuments, of course, I mean, you know that we know this struggle of monuments, destroying old monuments, bringing down statues and bringing up statues. But I should also mention that um, in Baghdad in Iraq, there is another monument, uh, liberation monument in central Baghdad, which uh, uh, was finished in 1961, which represents the revolutionary era in Iraq after toppling the pro-British uh, monarchy. And that um, monument is quite uh, powerful and quite meaningful. And that square itself has come uh, to mean so much for Iraqis because that's also where the uprising that started in 2019 started in a way. Uh, but the monument itself uh, speaks to Iraq's history, Iraq's Mesopotamian history, but also to the modern, the contemporary struggle for freedom and so on and so forth. So I guess I wanted to say that there are monuments that really speak to collective sentiments and, but a lot of them are monuments that represent, um, you know, the official history of the state, which of course, many of us are, are opposed to, um, so. Thank you for that. We have a few more minutes and really the opportunity to tackle one more question. And this one is uh, more geared towards methods and perhaps a little more aspirational in nature because we do have a few emerging scholars in our mm -hmm. audience. And I'm sure many are very inspired and are, are sort of looking for paths to pursue maybe a similar kind of scholarship that you have presented here. Um, and this question also speaks to the value of poetry that you touched on earlier. Um, so the question is really, the way you combine fiction with academic inquiry is what is fascinating. 
And we would like to know, and I would also like to know, what can this approach offer to other disciplines methodologically? And uh, might your work even challenge the norms of knowledge production that we often see in academia? That's, <laughs> that's ensnaring me to, to start praising my work. No, but I should say, I mean, look, if, if we look at, um, um, you know, philosophy or psychoanalysis or all that, there is always a, a symbiotic relationship between literature and knowledge production. And for me also, I, uh, you know, speaking of the pre-modern Arabic, Arabo-Islamic tradition, I'm always fascinated by those books of adab that combine different genres. And in one book, you would find uh, biographical tidbits, you would find literary criticism, you would find history, and you find, you find poetry. And that has always been my example. But also, we, we speak oftentimes of interdisciplinarity, and we aspire to it, but it's so difficult to, to, um, to practice. But I've tried to do that not only in my scholarship, I mean, I'm lucky because my training was largely in poetry. Um, but I've tried to do that. And I think, I mean, that's where if I may say so, and this is going to be a generalization, but the most exciting scholarship that is emerging is scholarship that is trying as much as possible to fuse all of these disciplines together and not think in, you know, very uh, monolingual uh, types. I mean, but of course, it's, it's difficult to transcend because we are, in a way, hostage to the to institutions that we come through, in a way, and it takes a lot of effort and imagination to to transcend the disciplinary boundaries that, that, you know, they are changing, but some of them are still there. So it might sound like a cliche, but to, to be imaginative and to challenge oneself and to think outside of the box, I think it's, it's, it's very, very important. We've now reached the end of today's webinar. And we, just from our heart, we would like to thank Sinan Antun and Salim Kuru and all of you for your continued interest. We very much look forward to hosting you again on April 22nd at 3.30 Pacific time, when we will welcome Professor Dean Spade and Dr. Christian Capitescu, who will be discussing collective suffering and mutual care as a foundation of anti-capitalist humanness. And on behalf of all of the organizers, we wish you a very good evening, good day, and thank you so much.